Aloha, I'm Dazen Hakias. I'm the host of Healing with Aloha podcast located on the island of Kauai. On this podcast, we talk about grief, we talk about mental health, we talk about healing, and we talk about having passion for life. We bring hope and healing globally. So thank you everyone for joining us today. My special guest, this is Allison known as Allison Fab. Uh, she knows what makes people tick. As a former social worker, she's worked with over 900 adults, children, and families with a variety of challenges, diagnosis, and socioeconomic statuses. But it doesn't stop there. She's also spent over eight years in the online entrepreneur space. As a certified happiness trainer, business performance coach, and marketing consultant, Allison will help you feel better about the conversations and perspectives you both share and participate in bringing you closer to the answer of who you are and why you do what you do, all while growing your impact and income with practical success and happiness solutions. Guys, let me introduce you. This is Allison. Hi, Allison. Hello. Or should I say aloha, right? Yeah, aloha. <laughs> aloha too. Oh, so Allison, I'm so grateful um, to finally have you on here. Um, you know, you've been uh, making changes and, and growing. And the one thing that we we're talking about earlier that I was interested to, to learn is what is a certified happiness trainer? That's a great question. I don't know the answer. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we're all learning. <laughs> right. So there is a program that there's actually a happiness studies academy that was created by Dr. Tal Ben Shahar, who's a former Harvard professor, taught positive psychology, had the most popular class at Harvard um, in positive psychology. And he has created this entire program based on the science of happiness, which is based on positive psychology. But a certified happiness trainer goes through learning the science of happiness the studies around it, uh, the positive psychology, and then practical solutions to apply it into people's lives in a holistic manner, not just like, oh, I feel good, but really holistic happiness is what it's about. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's interesting. Um, uh, we were talking and I said, a lot of times people can associate happiness to just uh, material possessions or happiness associated to uh, like achievements. You know what I mean? And you were explaining to me earlier that the holistic approach is there's different ways of like encompassing happiness. Can you kind of share with them? And then maybe we can, um, I can talk about each one. Sure. More further. Yeah. So it's built on what's called the SPIRE method. So S-P-I-R-E, which is an acronym. So the S is, stands for spirituality. Then P is physical. I is intellectual, R is relational, and E is emotional. So each one of those are like a different piece of who you are and your, your health and how you can rate yourself on different scales. All of that combines into your feelings of happiness. Uh, do you find like after you went through the training that people tend to lean to one of those areas? Yes. Like which one do you find that people tend to, that they study show? Well, studies show that relational is the number one predictor of happiness, which I think you can see the evidence of what the pandemic did. It impacted people's happiness significantly because it changed the way that people could have relationships. So mm. relational is the number one predictor of happiness. Um, as far as where people go, I think they go to whatever they're most comfortable with. And that's just a personal preference. So if you really love, um, you know, a spiritual practice, whatever that, it doesn't have to be religion in any way, just when S, the spiritual piece is just a spiritual practice. Um, and if that's your go-to and that's just really comfortable for you, but you don't necessarily spend a lot of time on um, your emotional health, even though they're combined, like it, you don't really like to talk about your emotions. You don't want, you just want to like focus on the spiritual, that, that would be where you go. It's different for everybody. People who are really into their health, they're great on the physical aspects, perhaps, 
but then they neglect the others. And so when you combine all of them, that's where you can really feel happier overall. Yeah. But I think, you know, I mean, I know your background, you know, you're a social worker and, you know, you've been helping people. A lot of it has to do with um, the way we're taught. Yes. So that's why we're going to lean into certain ways to find happiness. But then like your goal is to help people to consider other ways to extract happiness. Yeah. Instead of, like you said, they may lean more towards relationships, but then in actuality, they never were taught how to, to be spiritual or, you know, how to, you know, does that make sense? Yes. Well, and I also think as we were talking earlier, it's uh, our life circumstances, not just what we were taught, but the, the situations that we're in also impact what areas we feel like we have the energy or capability to work on. Um, I talk about, so, you know, my, my business is the fab messy middle. So the messy middle is just all the crap that happens in your life, whatever yeah. It happens to be, it could be a moment in time. It could be months, years, whatever, the, just the messiness, the realness of life and adding fab is feeling better in that messiness and having mm. practical, practical solutions. So, so many times, especially like I go back to the, you know, my social work background and all of the families, like, like you mentioned at the beginning, I've worked with all different socioeconomic statuses, like millionaires, people in extreme poverty, um, all different educational, you know, levels, doctors and people whose IQ was, you know, in the forties. Like I, I've worked with everybody and a lot of it is we're in survival mode. And so we don't even look at our other options and, or everything feels really overwhelming. When you think physical health, you think, okay, well, I have to eat all the things like I have to, I have to completely change what I eat and I need to exercise all the time. I was talking to a friend recently about, about her physical health goals. And, uh, she was talking about, you know, she really needs to like control her, her food and take mm. something along those lines. And I said, I got this great advice from a friend many years ago. And it's something I always go back to when I feel like I need to work on my physical health and it's to just add in one good thing. So add in a piece of fruit a day or add in an extra glass of water, which feels way less overwhelming than right. you know, and like overhaul. Right. Or eliminating <laughs> things that are our coping mechanisms at the moment, you know, whatever they happen to be. So let's, let's practical success solutions, something simple that, that you can, you can change because again, going back to it's what we learned, what we were taught if we were, if we, we've developed these habits, we've developed, you know, the neural pathways in our brains, which are really, if, if you know anything about neural pathways, like if you look at a brain and it's got those grooves, it's the deeper, wider grooves are things you've done longer. And they're mm. the harder ones to modify because they're deeper. So but you can create new ones. Neuroplasticity is a real thing, which gives me so much hope. Like you can create a new <laughs> groove, new new habits, new ways of Thank being. goodness. Yes, yeah. right? Like people didn't know that before. They thought you're just. But I think like what you're saying, like, um, just like I call it micro, like, yeah. you know, like making those micro changes it, and then it, it's more um, easy to adapt. And then you keep like adding on. I think that's smarter because people have a tendency to just go all in and burn out. Right. Well, and then you feel like a failure too. I don't know if you can relate to this. I'm a recovering people pleaser, recovering perfectionist. So when I set a goal and I don't consistently achieve it, then I feel like a failure mm -hmm. and I have shame. <laughs> We're talking about yes. shame as well. Yeah. So yeah. When you have a, a micro goal or something really small and simple, you build your self-belief muscle. And that's what you really want to strengthen because the stronger your self-belief muscle gets, the more you can, more weights you can add to it, the more little changes you can make. No, and I I think you're right, like building that muscle, like 
the self-esteem and the self-confidence. Uh, what is like one thing that you learned that is something practical that someone could try to, to build that self-esteem and your self-confidence? If, if you feel like I flatline, I, I doubt myself, I don't know where to begin. You know, what is a practical you'd recommend someone to start with? I would say make a list of all of the things that you want to change. Pick the one that feels the easiest and then cut that goal in half and then cut that goal in half again. That's awesome. Because <laughs> do, do you feel like when people set goals, it's unrealistic yeah. initially? Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's I've been told I'm unrealistic. Well, it's, it's, it's achievable, but it's not achievable long-term because you can't, it's, it's the whole willpower thing. You, willpower can, it's, it's great temporarily, but it will only get you so far. So mm -hmm. if you have a goal and you see that you've made progress on it, you're going to feel a lot better about setting another goal. So mm -hmm. if you cut it in half and then cut it in half again, it, that's, I think, the best way to do it, to start. Yeah. Start, and then the the, the progress, you, you build it. Yeah. It, it'll come, and it doesn't have to be like, I did it in a month, <laughs> which sometimes that's what we want. We're like, okay, I want to lose weight. It has to show, like, this month. And if it doesn't, then you abandon it. Right. And it's, it's about how you feel, too, like, a great thing to start doing is to do a weekly check-in. So if you use that SPIRE model, the S-P-I-R-E, and again, S, spiritual, P, physical, I, intellectual, R, relational, E, emotional, okay? So I would write down like what, what each one means. And then if you can rate yourself once a week, what, what would you give yourself? Like what, on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel you are in that area? And then, so you want to rate, then you want to evaluate, like why, and then you mm -hmm. want to prescribe, what would you change to increase the number? And then from there, take that goal, cut it in half, cut it in half again. And, but you can see the progress that you're making if you're, if you're giving yourself kind of a check-in, like overall how you feel, and you can see the progress that you're making. Yeah, and also I think it's important for people to not feel obligated to be at a 10. Because, you know, they're like on a scale of one to 10, you know, and everybody wants to hit a 10 in all areas, but it's as, as much as we'd want to, it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. And then what would we be striving for? Mm -hmm. Like if you had a 10 in all the areas, what's the point? <laughs> right? right? <laughs> I don't have to do anything. I'm good. I'm good for the rest of my life. Right. I'm good. I have no more goals. I'm just going to <laughs> exist and you'll get bored really fast. And that's not the growth, which is why like the intellectual piece is so important. It's about that constant growth and learning and expanding in whatever area is interesting to you. Yeah. Um, what are some things you recommend for people um, to have some like intellectual growth? like listening, reading, um, like spending time with people, what, what would you recommend? I really am all about personalization. So I don't think there's a one size fits all approach. And I think that the most important thing is knowing what you like the most. What, mm -hmm. what do you enjoy for, for learning? For example, do you love to listen? Do you love to listen to podcasts? Or do you love to read or are you more of a kinesthetic, like let's do things. And so mm -hmm. maybe get a little kit and build something. It just, it, the, the intellectual learning doesn't have to be, you know, this. studying. Yeah. Or getting degrees or what somebody says that you should learn. It's about what do you enjoy learning more about? It's you know, learning about how to take care of your plants and do that. I know for me lately, I've been in um, my, I've, I've been in a lot more messiness 
And <laughs> so I haven't had the same amount of energy to put forth that I normally would. And so my intellectual <laughs> learning has been binge watching TikTok videos on how to like do um, rental friendly home improvement or like decoration things. That's I've, I've hey, that, that's a great one. <laughs> I love it. Like I'm, I'm like I am learning things. I'm going to apply these, and I also kind of just get to veg out right now, which is what I need. So <laughs> you're not you're not stuck with what works for you now is going to work with you work for you later. Like you've got to adapt and and just know what what's going to work for you best at the moment. Well, so like with TikTok, for example, you know you're probably learning, and then there's music and there's video, and it's like it's the consumption part of it. Yeah. It's bite-sized. Yes, it is bite-sized. And I can I can move and I can turn off the volume if I can't handle that as well. Yes, the bite size really, as you point that out, makes a difference because there have been a few videos that are like three minutes and I realized like, I don't have the capacity for three minutes right now. Like I need like 30 seconds. I can handle 30 seconds. At a time. I just want to see something, yeah, bite-sized. <laughs> But no, that, that's, that's, that's good to know. Cause I think a lot of times, um, you know, people can be on social media and everybody's putting out content and saying, this is what you should do. This is what you should do. This is what you should do. And people can get um, overwhelmed and maybe discouraged because like you said, we don't, they don't like listening to audiobooks. They don't like listening to podcasts because they'd rather be more hands-on. They'd rather, um, you know, like watch something instead of listen. You know what I mean? Um, people are just like starting to get like, you know, like compare, comparing themselves. And so they get discouraged. Um, what, what do you think like people should consider so that they can get away from feeling that comparison and because it that's what takes away your happiness steals your happiness is right. you're you're listening to everybody tell this is how you should live this is what you should do and the next you know you're just like defeated yeah I I think a great question is asking why do I want this mm. so one of my favorite quotes um, from Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar, who created the Happiness Studies Academy, is that happiness is life's ultimate currency. So if you think about that, it's really everything boils down to wanting to be happy. Like if you think I'm going to, or I, I need to create, I don't know, um, I need to create short form videos, okay? because that's what I'm being told for, you know, that's what's working for social media right now. Okay. Why do you want to create it? Well, because I think that I'm going to get more clients that way. Why do you, why do you want more clients? Uh, because I think I'm going to get more money. Why do you want more money? Well, I need more money, but why? Like, what, what do you want to do with the money? I want to be able to just go to the beach. Okay. Why do you want to go to the beach? Because I really just want to be in nature and I just want to take a break okay, so then how can you take a break right now? Like that's, nice. you know, like going back to the why, or if, if it's about taking a break or it's about being in nature, how can you be in nature in a way that works for you with social media, for example, or how you're presenting yourself online? There's a lot of times over the years, especially with with my social work job, I mean, I used it with, you know, business coaching clients as well, life coaching, but especially in the social work um, position that I was in most recently, a lot of people had very limited resources and limited abilities. And so they had these big dreams, just like everyone, right? We have these giant dreams and we don't always have the time or the resources to achieve them. So when you mm -hmm. go back to what is it about that dream that you really want and find the little pieces that you can feel right now, it's going to give you more of that happiness. Mm. And who knows, you may change your dream, you know, as a result, but there's ways to feel little bits of that, even in situations that feel very messy or you're stuck or you feel boxed in. It's almost like 
um, like as I'm listening to you, it's like finding pockets of happiness because there's this idea like it has to be this big for me to be happy. But like what you're saying is like scale it down so that you can have pockets of happiness um, and making do with what you have. And then, you know, you can always scale, the you can always expand, but to not say, I can't be happy until I achieve this big thing, but that you can um, be able to, like, say, for example, people want to go tra travel to someplace, you know, in the world. Hey, I have an idea. What about um, visiting a part of um, your town or your state that you've never been? that that that's exciting I mean you know it's something new and and then it's exploring like th does that make sense yes yes and you have something to look forward to and yes it's it and it's also about it's about being present so I love I don't know if you've ever taken the Clifton have you ever taken the Clifton Straits Finder test mm -mm. so it there's a couple different tests that you can take that help you find your strengths which is really good to know what works well for you and what doesn't. But one of my top, well, my, my top strength is called futuristic, hmm. which means I love to look at the future. And um, I love dreaming about the future, creating things about the future. Like I, I very much live in the future, okay? <laughs> which sometimes can prevent me from living in the present. Mm -hmm. and so focus on the, on the future for the past, um, future, especially you can get really anxious because you're so focused on the future. And when you're so focused on the past, you can get really depressed Yes. versus focusing on the present and finding, finding those moments of joy, finding those moments of happiness, finding those moments of peace in the present. When I talk about like core desired feelings, my core desired feeling is peaceful joy. That's mm -hmm. it might not be happiness. Everybody has a def different definition of happiness. But peaceful joy is really what I ultimately want. I want to feel peaceful and I want to feel a sense of joy. And so that might not, that might mean I don't get to go to Italy next year to the World Happiness Summit there, but how can I find, you know, like the peaceful joy here in this moment? Yes, no. And, and, and I think that's great. I, I think it's uh, for some of us, it's, it's shifting how we look at things and how we go about it so that we won't, we don't always have that, um, what is that feeling, fear of missing out, F yes. F -O -M -O. FOMO, mm -hmm. yes, FOMO, yeah, fear of missing out, because um, a lot of times you can feel that way, and, and being reminded that when you're looking on social media, you're looking at people's highlights, yes, in their reels, yep, yes, I actually created a program last year called Real to Real, which was um, was was talking about going from the highlight reel to the real imperfect you and that's and sharing more of that and that's what's been really important to me yeah share the happy things that the people want but they also have to realize that you're a human too and you mess up and you get frustrated with your kids or you sometimes like taking a shower is your biggest accomplishment of the day if people yeah. don't know that then they're comparing themselves to this non-achievable you know ideal like you you can't you can't be happy all the time like it's just not it's that that's not life um we another thing that i think is really important to talk about that i one of the key concepts that i learned through this you know year-long certification program is permission it's called permission to be human mm. which means that humans experience every range of emotion and that is normal if you don't experience them most likely you're either dead or you're a sociopath like those are the two reasons that you wouldn't experience the range of emotions right and we don't want that right <laughs> yeah we want to be able to acknowledge everything correct but it's it's normal to feel all of the emotions the important thing is what do you do with those emotions once you feel them? But it's like, there's nothing wrong with necessarily feeling angry or sad or jealous. 
Like those are normal human emotions, but then how long do you stay in the emotion and what do you do with it? That's where you have the power and the choice. But permission to be human, like, yes. Permission to be human means that you don't have a highlight reel all the time. <laughs> yeah. That's not human. That's, that's AI, like <laughs> not real. No, and that's, no, and I agree. And that's so true. And I think like for even like, I've had conversations with people that, as much as like you know they say you have to post like say if you're there you're online for for business or for personal whatnot that it's okay to take breaks it's okay that it's messy it's okay that it doesn't make sense to people Um, it's okay if you know because it's it's really your your journey and you put that pressure on yourself that doesn't need to be there you know um yeah you're also if you don't allow yourself to be messy at times I'll just use the word messy since that's my kind of go-to word you are reinforcing the dysfunctional ideal Mm. because if you have everything perfect all the time and you never take a break you're everybody who's watching you realizes like oh, look, here's one more person who's always perfect, who never takes a break or who never has typos or who never X, Y, Z. So the more that we normalize our humanness, especially on social media, the more like we actually help the world as a whole because we're giving other people permission to feel okay in their imperfections, which... Mm again is part of being human yeah no and 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 I think that's great because it's not something that we were taught you know it's okay to be perfect no when you're in school you you know you want to have like A's you want to perform and you want to be a certain type of way Uh, and then you get older and you realize like oh I can't continue this performance thing you know you get into real life work marriage being a parent and then everything like you said it gets messy but it's normal and I think that's what people need to understand that you're normal and nobody has it all together you know and you shouldn't have to feel that way even though you do it's 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 not that pressure letting it go um, is important and learning how to let go and you know finding that harmony yeah very much so because when we think we're the only ones we don't share it and then it just gets heavier and then it gets harder to do anything at all with it because we feel embarrassed or like people are going to judge us if we share anything they're going to think we're you know weird or um I was talking to my daughter last night and she was so she, she was saying, sharing something that had happened at school and she's like, it was really awkward. I said, I, I'm sorry. Like I get that, that it was really awkward, but you're not the only person that that happens to, like it happens to yeah. other people too. But, but when nobody talks about it or acknowledges it, then you feel like there's something wrong with you. And then you have all these extra emotions on top of what you're already dealing with. Yes. No, but I think that's good that she she had the courage to even tell you that and that you can remind her like um, you're it, it happens and, and and you're not the only one because it's the anxiety of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe this happened. And then you just feel like you're a magnet for all the bad things. You know what I mean? But then in actuality, it, it, it does happen to other people. It's just not everybody's going to admit it. Right. Yeah. And it it allows you to stop taking the, take the focus off of that. When we're talking about, um, we're talking earlier before the call about positive psychology and what it, like the difference between traditional psychology and the newer field of positive psychology, it's not super new. It's 90s, I think is when it came about. Um, Traditional psychology would focus on the problem Mm -hmm. and fixing the problem, eliminating the problem versus positive psychology is more growth focused Mm -hmm. and 
you know, what we focus on expands energetically. So when we're focused on a problem, that's where all of our energy goes. And when we're focused on growing and expanding, we're, you know, in that energy. So when we think we're the only one, and then we think nobody else feels this way or is experiencing whatever this thing is, then we're really focused on hiding it. And then we feel even more uncomfortableness around it. And then it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. So just going back to what you were just saying about acknowledging it, that it's normal and we're not the only ones, I think it's just, it's just so important. Yeah. And I, and I think um, definitely learning to find people who are safe to, yeah. to acknowledge and to share because not everybody, not everyone is worthy of knowing the things that we're going through. Um, and they can take, you know, our confidence in us trusting them. And sometimes they can make it like it hurts us because it goes against why we didn't want to share it in the first place. Right. Yes. Yeah. I heard many years ago um, from uh, Kate Croco, the person I initially heard this from, that you share your scars, not your wounds. And I liked that concept a lot. I've modified it over the years to share your scabs, not your wounds. So once there's been a little, just a little bit of healing, like that's when you can share it maybe with more people, but when it's really raw, then you have to be very careful with who you choose to share it with as far as, you know, finding a safe person. But as it scabs a little bit, and then you get a little stronger, even before it's become a scar, then as you share more, then it gets like that, that wound begins to heal more and more and you get stronger. I know over the last, you know, two years, the last two years have created a lot of insight for me and like brought up things that I didn't realize were still wounds. <laughs> I thought had like, I thought they were scars, but nope, they got like cut open a little bit and woo, here we go. Um, but <laughs> over the last two years, I've really, as I've, I've shared a little bit more and I've grown a little bit more and those, those scars have, have started to heal more. Like I've gotten so much stronger as a result. So I think it's important to do. But you know what? It's funny. Like, it's not funny, but like what you're sharing is, is true. We think that we're okay and we're healed. And then we realize we're not, and it's okay. You know, um, like people need to understand it's okay. You know, sometimes you got to go revisit back in this situation, um, this moment, maybe you never dealt with it. You thought you did, or you tried to ignore it and then things pop up and then this is your chance to acknowledge it and, and work, process it to, okay. to heal from it. I, I've become so much more aware that it's actually our bodies way of protecting us mm -hmm. and our brain's way of protecting us because I don't think that you know we, we don't necessarily become as aware of things until we're ready to heal that next layer so if it's something that we thought we totally healed and then oh no nope, here it is again um, okay <laughs> guess what that means that you're ready to do a little bit more growth uh, I my my brain hasn't my memory hasn't been as my, my memory hasn't been as great lately as I would like it to be. I actually had in January, I fell, got a concussion, mild concussion, oh. yeah, <laughs> which also was God's way of showing me, okay, this isn't working. Let's just, it also forced me to rest, but I, I got to really see my brain in action because there were times where I was like, I, I literally like my, it's just not moving. Like I could see it was really bizarre. Because I never had any experience with that with myself or someone else. So afterwards, I was like, okay, I'm good. And then I had other stuff that I'm dealing with. Like, I can't, you know, that's really weird. I, I can't remember the details of these random things that aren't really important at the moment. I remember what's important. The rest, I'm not really remembering. And I've come to realize that it's my brain is preserving my energy for what I need at the moment. Like mm -hmm. I'm in function, focus, move forward. I can tell you all this stuff about the happiness stuff. That's what I need at the moment. What hospital my daughter was born at? It's not really that important. It was 12 years ago. I don't need to remember that right now, right? Right. It's really, it's our bodies and our brains. And I think God, 
you know, my, my belief system way of helping us to continue moving forward, protecting us, helping us move forward, protecting us, helping us move forward. When we're ready, we get to revisit those things. Yeah. Because sometimes it's too much for us, yeah. you know, at the, at the time, like we, we, we wonder why can't we, but it's, it is it, just best for us. Not now, you know what I mean? Um, and I think like in the process of learning to have um, self-compassion, yeah. you know, because you're not going to always be able to get through something. Um, but in the best that you can, you will, is just like learning how to love yourself, even when it's hard. I, I, I think I find that that's something that I'm learning and I'm, I realize I'm not as good in that department. It's like, I think it's easier to, to want to encourage and love other people, but um, to have that towards yourself, it's, it's, it doesn't come naturally for some of us. Well, and that goes back to, at least in my experience, it goes back to what we were taught. You know, those, as, as when we're younger, we develop so much in such a short amount of time. And that really becomes the anchor for, you know, the rest of our lives a lot of the time. Or if, if, or if you're in a long-term situation and, you know, you, you're care caring for other people, like that becomes your main focus. You don't have the time or the energy to put towards yourself. And so it's a new skill sometimes, or it feels like a new skill to have that self-love, that compassion, or if people have been in your life who've told you that, you know, it's selfish to take care of yourself. It's really hard to do it and feel like it's a good thing. I know I've experienced that personally a lot. No. And, and, and that, that is something important for people to understand that sometimes it's hard because yeah, we were taught you're selfish for taking care of yourself and, you know, you can start to change that because it's not, if you can't fill your cup and you can't take care of yourself, you become empty and what you give other people, it's like your leftovers because you're not you know um and 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 I think it's weird because like we don't always stop and, and think like how am I really doing you know do I feel feel love do I feel happy do I have joy do I have peace we, we don't check in with ourselves but I think it's important to check in with ourselves right yeah yeah because you're you want to give from the overflow of of what you have it goes back to that whole um you know the oxygen tank or the, not the oxygen tank, the oxygen mask analogy, you know, and when you're on a plane, you have mm -hmm. to put on your oxygen mask first before you can help someone else because otherwise you're going to pass out. You're not going to be able to, look at all those people you could have saved if you would have just <laughs> took care of yourself first. Yeah, no, and, and I think, like, if anything, like, that is a way for us to end this. <laughs> you know, our, our time together is exactly, if you, the way you're taught on an airplane is put the oxygen on, on yourself first, yes. take care of yourself, love yourself, identify um, the parts of what makes you happy and find those pockets of happiness. And, and then you can help other people. Yes. Is yes. there anything else you wanted to share with everyone before uh, we end today? But the one little thing that I go back to when I'm like, I don't know if this is gonna make a difference. I don't wanna do anything. Um, there's actually, I don't, can't quote the study, because I don't remember those details. I just been like, okay, what can we do that's going to, you know, help us? That's the part that I remember. There was actually a study that two minutes, just two minutes of journaling will have positive effects 30 days later. Oh, yes. really? I didn't hear of that before. Yep. Yep. So um, if you were ever like, I just can't do anything, just set a timer for two minutes and journal something for two minutes, whatever it happens to be, and be like, you know what? I'm going to have positive effects for the next 30 days. I love that. Two minutes, guys. We can do two minutes. Yes. Right? There's creative ways. If you can't write it, you can always record yourself for two minutes and just and just free flow. Yep. Um, Allison, what is the best way for people to find you? Um, is there a certain place um, that you are on social media? And then what is your website? 
I I enjoy Instagram the most. I'm also on Facebook, kind of exploring TikTok a smidge, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> for really just scrolling those videos, right? Binge watching. Uh, it's I'm Allison Fab on social media. So A L L I S O N F A B. And so you can find me on Instagram, all, all the places. My website is allisonfab.com or thefabmessymiddle.com. Okay. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. And I'm glad that you're leaning into happiness. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I love the way you explained it. And guys, um, definitely need connect with Allison. Um, you know, follow her on social media. If you guys have any questions, reach out to her. And uh, thank you guys. Um, if you haven't already, subscribe to Healing with Aloha. And you guys have a great and beautiful day. Aloha. Aloha.